Hey guys, thanks for tuning in today. My name is Mark Smith and this is Online Bible Study for Red House Baptist Church. We are finishing up uh, our first quarter. We're actually going to do two quarters in the book of Genesis. We're finishing up our first quarter with chapter 19 verses 12 through 26. Uh, the title of the lesson is Purged, Destruction Comes to Those Who Dishonor God. And you know, when, when I look at that title, I think of uh, so many people who probably don't understand uh, the title and the subtitle in that, why would God destroy that which is good? And the, the short answer to that is he doesn't. Uh, we're not good. Uh, we dishonor God. And when you think about it, guys, we started that in the garden and we continue to do that with the sinfulness in our lives. And we certainly deserve the very worst of the worst, even though God has given us the very best of the best, the perfect sacrifice of his son, his one and only son, Jesus. And we'll talk about that as we go through today's lesson. So as we normally do, let's go ahead and start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for its truthfulness. Father, we thank you for its message, not only of hope and redemption, but Father God, also of punishment and destruction. That Father God, there are consequences to the decisions that we make in our lives and that father you love us so much that you give us the opportunity to make decisions for better or for worse and father god that's the only way we can demonstrate our love for you is to be able to to do the opposite to be able to father god disobey you and, and you love us so much that you give us that option you love us so much that father god you created a way in our own sinfulness to be able to come to you through your son, Jesus. Father, we don't deserve it, but we thank you so much for that kind of love. Father, forgive us of the sin in our lives. Move in our lives that we might honor you and bring glory to you. And it's in the name of Jesus that I pray, amen. All right, I've already mentioned the title and let's just go ahead and, and get started with this. Can you remember having a friend when you were a child who seem to always get in trouble or maybe always get you in trouble. And you know, I had a few friends who came to mind and the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, maybe I was that friend. Maybe I was the one who kind of led some of them into trouble. But there was a boy that I went to elementary school with when I was in first grade, Whitehall was uh, hit by a tornado. Whitehall Elementary School was hit by a tornado and we had to finish our first grade year at Kit Carson. So we were in part of a library and I had a friend that we shared a lot of interests together and he had little army men, little toy soldiers. I don't know if you all remember those little green plastic deals. And uh, we were talking about that and he just got up and walked out of class. Teacher didn't see him. I didn't say anything. And he came back to class. He'd gone to his brother's classroom and he picked up some of those little toy soldiers and we were playing with those and the teacher noticed. And I can vaguely remember us both getting in trouble, but him getting in deeper trouble because he had left the class. And, uh, you know, I always uh, think about my, my buddy, Tim, uh, when I was a kid, uh, Tim was my best friend and we did everything together. He had a uh, paper route and we would ride our bikes. We'd, we'd finish the paper route and we'd get on our bikes and we would ride down Lost Fork Road and we would go cane pole fishing in people's ponds and we didn't ask for permission that I can remember. Uh, we just kind of went and did our thing. Um, and, and I'm not sure we even asked permission from our parents. We just kind of did that. And I can also remember that we even started chewing tobacco on his paper route. Uh, we were little stinkers, but we fought all the time as well. Uh, his older brother would kind of ag it on and, and his dad would break us up. But man, we just, we were little bitty troublemakers at that time. Uh, so. Do the bad choices that we make in life have consequences? Well, and what about the good ones? And if you paid attention to the prayer, uh, certainly you know that they do. Uh, they, they all, everything we do has consequences. Um, from our relationships to our health, to the people that we choose to spend our time around, our decisions impact our lives, not only our lives, but the lives of others, both good and bad. We harp on our kids or maybe our grandkids to choose their friends wisely. And we stay on them about making good, godly choices uh, because we've experienced the consequences of, of good choices and bad choices. And as, as parents and grandparents, we not only want to tell 
our children and our grandchildren what the right thing is to do, but to model that kind of behavior. So does God expect us to make the right choices? And the short answer to that is yes. He wants us to live according to his statutes, his ordinances, and his commandments. You see, God is love. God is gracious. God is merciful. But we can't forget, and a lot of people want to just kind of skip over this, God is just. And we always have to remember that God is just. And he gives us freedom to make choices. But sometimes those choices have consequences that we didn't intend. But if we live in God's ways, then we don't have to worry about those things. All right, so just a little background here as we get into this. In chapter 17, God reaffirmed his covenant with Abraham and the descendants of his and Sarah's offspring. Both Abraham and Sarah were in their 90s when God once again confirmed that great nations would come from Abraham, both Isaac and Ishmael. So uh, shortly thereafter, in chapter 18, God and two angels appeared to Abraham outside his tent, and Abraham and Sarah uh, had asked Sarah to prepare some bread for them, and then he had his servants go out and, and kill a calf and, and prepare this food for them. Abraham was excited to have them, and he wanted to do for them. And the Lord once again confirmed that Sarah would become pregnant by Abraham and that she would have a son within a year. And Sarah was inside the tent and she heard this and she laughed out loud. And, and God had asked Abraham why Sarah had laughed. And, and, and even Sarah said, oh, I didn't laugh. And God said, yes, you did. You laughed. All right. Uh, and, 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 he, and she did. But both Abraham and Sarah had found it amusing that they would conceive and that she would give birth at such an advanced age. That didn't make sense, all right? That's not the way the world works. But God assured them that he is God and he is capable of anything. This would have been a small miracle. God then turned his attention to the wicked cities of both Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham had asked God to spare them. He actually negotiated. God said, you know, if I can find 50 uh, righteous people, then I won't destroy it. And Abraham said, okay, well, what about 40? And then what about 30? Then what about 20? Then what about 10? What if you can find 10? God said, fine, if there are 10, I won't destroy it. Uh, so God agreed, even as Abraham negotiated with Father God. All right, let's go ahead and look at today's verses. And like I said, we start in chapter 19. Let's go ahead and start with verses 12 through 17. Then the angels said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, a son-in-law, your sons and daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of this place, for we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against his people is so great before the Lord that the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws who were going to marry his daughters. Get up, he said, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. At daybreak, the angels urged Lot on, get up, take your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of the city. But he hesitated. Because the Lord's compassion for him, the men grabbed his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters. They brought him out and left him outside the city. As soon as the angels got them outside, one of them said, run for your lives. Don't look back and stop anywhere on the plain. Run to the mountains or you will be swept away. So why do you suppose Lot met the angels outside the city and urged them to stay with him? And this is, guys, I'm talking about the verses that are leading up to this, all right? So I, I hope you will go back and you'll read all of this and everything that leads up to this. But guys, really, Lot understood what these angels were going to encounter when they came in to Sodom. He knew how wicked the city had become. The angels had said, no, we're going to stay in the town square. And Lot begged them, please don't do that. Please come stay in my home where it's safe. All right. So instead, the men of the city surrounded his house when they saw these angels go in. And guess, they must have been beautiful. All right. And, and it says the men surrounded as these beautiful male angels went into his house. And they demanded of Lot, you bring them out here to us so that we can rape them. And Lot offered up his virgin daughters instead. He said, please don't do this. Here are my daughters. You can have them. 
But instead, the angels, they saved Lot. They dragged him back into the house. They, they barred the doors and they uh, blinded these people so they couldn't even find the door because even 10 righteous people could not be found inside the city. So even though they couldn't find 10 righteous people, what did the angels offer Lot? They didn't say, hey, Lot couldn't find them. Get your family and get out. They said, look, go find more family members. If you've got more family members here, go get them before we destroy it because we are going to destroy Sodom. So in this, we see that God is merciful to Lot. And remember that Lot is Abraham's nephew. God is merciful to Lot. God is merciful to Lot's family. Even his sons-in-law, those who had not yet married his daughters, said, go and get them. Even though the criteria had not been met, God is showing even more mercy. So how did his future sons-in-law react to being given the chance to get to safety? When Lot showed up and woke them up and said, come on, guys, we've got to get out. Sodom is about to be destroyed. Well, they didn't leave. They didn't believe Lot. You see, they trusted in their own ways and in the ways of their own culture to keep them safe. Even Lot and his family hesitated that next morning before leaving. So according to verse 17, how does God want us to react to sinfulness when we see it, when we see culture full of sinfulness, when we see actions full of sinfulness? How does he want us to react to that? That's where to run from it. He says, run for your lives and don't look back. Well, what does that mean? And, and the way I read this is that we look back when we long for something. Yes, when we long for the cultural norms that oppose God, when, when we uh, miss sin. Yes, he says, don't look back. You better run from sin and don't wish for it. Don't long for it. Just get out. See, we're to embrace God and his ways and not the ways of a sinful culture. And guys, you know, I, I've been asked, you know, do you think that we're in the end times? Don't you believe that we are in a culture today that embraces sin? And I do. I believe that we are in a sinful culture. I don't know how long that is. I don't know how far we are away. And even God says he's going to come like a thief in the night. We're not going to know that day. All right. But yes, we live in a sinful culture and we're not to embrace that. We're to embrace God's ways, not man's ways. All right. So uh, as we look at the next set of verses, and it's verses 18 through 22, but Lot said to them, no, my lords, please, your servant has indeed found favor with you, and you have shown me great kindness by saving my life, but I can't run to the mountains. The disaster will overtake me, and I will die. Look, this town is close enough for me to flee to. It's a small place. Please let me run to it. It's only a small place, isn't it, so that I can survive. And he said to them, all right, I'll grant your request about this matter too, and will not demolish the town you mentioned. Hurry up, run to it, for I cannot do anything until you get there. Therefore, the name of the city is Zoar. So why did Lot, after having been rescued, after having hesitated, after having had his wife and his daughters also having hesitated, why didn't he just go where he was told? Why didn't he just run to the mountains like God told them to do? Because there was a lack of faith. All right. There was fear. There was the unknown. We've talked about this before. We're often, guys, afraid of what we don't understand. But rather than trusting God and simply being faithful to God, he's trying to bargain with God. He's trying to negotiate with God. All right. And, and part of it might be the fact that when, when Lot and Abraham parted their ways over the lack of farmland, the lack of grazing land, Abraham gave Lot the choice, and Lot chose the valley uh, where, where Sodom and Gomorrah were, uh, and, and there was probably the draw of the city life and the sinfulness that was there, and, and he embraced it. And he had probably gotten used to living in a city with, with 
city comforts, all right? And maybe he was afraid that if he didn't at least go to a small town, he would not survive uh, in the wilderness. So how did the Lord react to this request? Did God say, doggone it, I told you, you have to go to the mountains. That's not what God did. What God said is, okay, I'll let you go to that small town and I will spare that small town. And I'm just amazed by this, that, that guys, even as God is sparing his life and the life of his, his wife and daughters, God understands their lack of faith and he allows us the safety and freedom even when we deserve death and destruction. You see, he allowed Abraham to bargain for Sodom and he allowed Lot to go elsewhere. I just think it's amazing that the God of the universe would even listen to us as we tried to outthink him, I guess. So what was the warning that the angels gave to Lot? They gave him a warning. They said, run, get away from here. All right, and that's the second time they did that. God is in a hurry to destroy this city that he had given ample warning to. All right, and he'd given them time to get away. You see, God is merciful as demonstrating in his willingness to negotiate with those that he created. He doesn't have to do that. He doesn't have to negotiate with us, but he does out of love. So guess how has God shown you mercy and grace over the years when that's not what you deserve? And guess we don't. None of us deserve anything because we haven't earned anything. How has God shown you mercy and grace? And I want you to think about that. I want you to kind of ponder on that. But guys, as a sinner, God provided a way for us to be forgiven and redeemed through Jesus, his one and only son. And if that's it, if that's the only way that God has ever shown us any mercy and any grace that is sufficient, there doesn't we don't need anything else. That alone is over the top amazing. But God also answers our prayers in ways that we ask him to. And it may not, I think about in my life, I don't always ask for God's will. I ask for specific things to be done in my will. And God often responds by saying, okay, I'll give you that. That's amazing. That's amazing that God would show us that kind of grace and that kind of mercy, but also that kind of freedom that he wants us in his will. And guys, as I have grown in my walk and as I've grown in my faith, I find myself praying more often for God's will because one of the things that I have found is that when I pray for God's will, he does more amazing things that I can even think to ask for do that. I'm urging you to do that. When you pray, pray for his will and then pray that you'll see it and that you'll respond to that in an appropriate way. All right, so let's go ahead and look at the last set of verses and it's verses 23 through 26. The sun had risen over the land when Lot reached Zoar. Then out of the sky, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, burning sulfur from the Lord. He demolished these cities, the entire plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and whatever grew on the ground. But Lot's wife looked back and became a pillar of salt. On whom did God pass judgment that morning? Well, he certainly passed judgment on the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. But he also passed judgment on Lot's wife. They were given instructions. Run, hurry up. I'll let you go to the small town that you want, but don't look back. You see, Sodom and Gomorrah had been wicked and 10 righteous people had not been found. They deserved their judgment from God. And a lot of people may look at that and say, well, you know, she didn't really do anything wrong, but she did. She disobeyed God. You see, she got what she deserved. And I just, again, I think about when we look back on the things that we miss, we long for the days in the past. I can't tell you, the older I get, the more I talk to people and they go, oh man, don't you just wish things were more like they used to be? And it appears as if his wife was longing for the wicked city 
that God was destroying. She was embracing that culture and she looked back on it longingly and God punished her for it. Isn't it possible that Sodom and Gomorrah were simply victims of a natural disaster or natural phenomenon? And no, it's not. All right. It says in here, then out of the sky, the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah, burning sulfur from the Lord, not from a volcano, not from anything other than what God had done. God rained burning sulfur down on the cities, killing all the inhabitants and all the vegetation. But doesn't this simply prove that God is simply a vengeful, mean God? because I hear that being said about God. And that is not what it says. If that's what you read in this, you missed the point. Yes, God is just. Yes, if God isn't just, there is no mercy. Hey, if there's no justice, there's no mercy. There's no good, there's no bad, there's no up, there's no down. Yes, we cannot have a merciful God if he's not also just. They got what they deserved, but they were given opportunities. They had given over to their sinfulness and they celebrated. Understand, we are all sinners in need of a redeeming God, a forgiving God. Guys, they were celebrating sin and, and they were challenging God and his statutes. And they did it over and over and over and over. Guys, we get what we deserve in death. We'll all die and we all earn that. But if we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we can receive God's mercy, his grace, and his redemption through the perfect sacrificial lamb of Jesus. God is jealous. He's merciful. He is love. But praise God for who he is and what he has done and for what he has promised to do. Because God is also faithful. And no matter what it is you're going through in your life right now, trust in God. He is faithful. And the more we trust in him, the more he blesses us. All right, guys, I hope that God continues to bless you and your family. Love you guys. Hope to see you soon.